I thought I had said before that when someone says to you, God bless you, you say, God bless you more. I thought I said that before. So God bless you all. Amen. You first say amen and you too more. So one more time, God bless you. Amen. So the wise minister who says that because I've got, God knows how many thousands of God bless me this morning. Hallelujah. At time, I don't have a lot of time this morning. I was on the same flight with pastor yesterday coming back uh, from holiday. So I'm fresh from the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Genesis, the 18th chapter. I believe sincerely God gave me a different word from what I had planned when pastor spoke to me over a month ago. So I cannot guarantee you that the message of this morning will be palatable to quite a lot of people, but I got to preach it anyway. It might sound hard and harsh, but I believe this is exactly the word for the hour. Genesis, the 18th chapter. We're going to read three verses of scripture, and then we will proceed as the Lord leads us. Genesis 18, I'm going to read from verse number 17 through to 19. Are we there? Are we there? And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. Can you say that after me, please? For I know him. Say it one more time. Who is speaking here? Good. That he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. May the Lord bless the reading and the listening to his word. Shall we pray together? Father, add your blessings to your word. May this word not go forth in the eloquence of any man's speech, least of all persons, my humble self. But Lord, grant that your word will go forth in the power and the demonstration of your spirit, so that the faith of these ones will not be in the words of men, but in your holy word. We ask that you anoint every air to be open, anoint every mind to be receptive, and the spirit, and the spirit of every man also receptive to your word, that in hearing indeed we will hear you. But more importantly, and as Pastor prayed, we will determine to be doers of your word. For it is in the doing of your word that there is reward. We give you thanks and praise you, the Holy Spirit, even as you take charge of this particular session. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the saints said the louder, Amen. Amen. Ask your neighbor, what does God think about me? Okay, ask yourself, what does God think about me? Now, this is very important. That will be the subject of my message this morning. What does God think, <clears throat> excuse me, about me? We live in a world today that seems to be upside down. Wherever you look, we are so concerned with everything else except that which matters. Little by little, but systematically, we've moved away from God. And I'm not talking of just Nigeria, I'm talking of the entire world, even I'm going to zero in on our nation. In places and nations where God used to be God, we've replaced him with everything else the man thought that he needed. Godliness has been thrown out of the window. Even in the church, and when I speak about the church, I speak as the church, as the ecclesia, the, the body of Christ at large, whether you're Pentecostal, whether you are Orthodox, whatever it is you call yourself, evangelicals. 
I'm not so sure of how much of God is in our churches, how much of God is in our lives as Christians. The focus has shifted, unfortunately. And things don't appear to be going any better. And so God will have me say to yourself, to everyone that is under the sound of my voice, exactly begin to think, if God were to speak concerning you, what will he say? And all the signs are clear that the, the second coming of Jesus is ever nearer than we think. We seem to have forgotten about that. We are so concerned about what somebody thinks about, you, about, about, us, about, about, our, about us. What my spouse thinks about me, what my parents think about me, what my friends think about me, what my pastor thinks about me, what my fellow Christians think about me. Nobody seems to care about what God thinks about him or her. And I'm here, God has asked me to tell you, it matters most what I, God, think about you. If we constantly live our lives thinking about that, I think we will be better Christians, better prepared for his return. Can somebody say an amen to that? Amen. A few years ago, I believe I was in this church and I preached a message titled, Who Art Thou? How many of you remember that message? Well, if you were here. Everybody say, Who Art Thou? If you forgot, I wouldn't forget that I preached that message here. And I remember, but two minutes recap, because it's important to get a good grasp of what we're going to be talking about today. We had looked at the text in that message was taken from Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13 through to 18, where Jesus, one day on the, on the way to Caesarea of Philippi, he had asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I'm going to remember the message. And they began to say, some says you are John the Baptist, some says you are Jeremiah, some says you are Elijah, some says you are one of the prophets. And Jesus said, okay, who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, you got it. Simon Paul, Jonah, blessed art thou, for surely flesh and blood, verse 16, had not revealed that to you, but my father which is in heaven. He says, and I will build my church of, he said, you are, the, you are Peter, which means Petrock, which means the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gate of hell shall not prevail against the church. And then he says in verse 18, And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, bound on earth whatever, in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And we said, the question of our personality matters a lot, which was why Jesus wanted to know what people thought of him. Did you remember that? And that we also said that it's important that you know how to think about yourself because three voices speak concerning us on a daily basis what you say you are or what you think or who you think you are what somebody else says you are and what god says you are if you remember again and then we concluded by saying that while it is important for you to know who you are you must not think too highly of yourself than you ought to romans 12 1 to 3 Romans 12, 1 to 3, the Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a holy and acceptable, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed, verse number 2, to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is just, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And verse 3, Paul says, And I say unto you, according to the grace which is given to me, that you think that no man will think more highly of himself than he ought to. But every man should think soberly as God has dared to every man, the measure of faith. Then we conclude that it's important the way you think of yourself. Don't think too low, don't think too high. That was the grasper mentality, the Gideon series, if you remember. God said, thou mighty man of valor." He said, who is he talking about? But we also conclude that it was not pride for you to call yourself who God calls you. So if God says you are X, that's who you are. It's not pride. That's who God calls you to be. But don't try to be higher than what God calls you. In Act 14, verse 15, Act 14, 15, after Paul and Silas had performed some miracles by the mercies of God, in verse 14 of Act 14, they came and they were worshiping them. And they cautioned them. Act 14, 15, they said, why are you doing this? We are also men like you. But we then said, people will call you who you are not. Some to destroy you, some 
to over encourage you. And you must be very careful not to accept adulations which don't rightly belong to you but to God. I'm sure you remember the story of Herod the Tetrarch. He sat upon his throne one day, he gave an oration, the Bible says, and the people said, The gods, these are gods. And the Bible said, Because he didn't reject it, he was struck dead on the same day. But the last thing we said in that message was that what matters most is not what you think about yourself. Not what anybody else thinks about you, but what God thinks about you. And it's important that you go out with your shoulders high as long as what you think of yourself or what somebody thinks or says about you lines up with what God says about you. Can somebody say an amen to that? Amen. And so this morning the question is, so what does God think about me? And I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. I'm particularly concerned about what God thinks about me. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. What has happened here is that through scriptures we find a catalog of characters. People like you and I, some of them who lived under what I call a less superior dispensation of law as against grace but who God still had some wonderful things to say about them and, and I want us to look at it because it's important let's start with Job everybody say Job in Job chapter number 1 verses 6 to 8 Job 1 6 to 8 listen to what word of God has to say the Bible says and in those days it came to pass that the sons of God gathered together themselves before the Lord and Satan also came amongst them in verse number 7, the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And he said unto God, From going to and fro upon the earth, from going back and forth upon the whole earth. <laughs> you know, the word of God is so wonderful. Second Chronicles 16 and verse number 9. The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord moveth to and flow upon the earth. So somebody is moving and running apart than the whole the earth. Somebody's eyes are moving. Who will get tired first? Come on, talk to me. Who will get tired first? <laughs> Hallelujah. But in, in Job 1 verse 8, the Bible then said something profound about Job. He said to the devil, Has thou considered my servant Job? And he, he, he said four things about Job. We're going to look into it one. This is not a friend of Job. This is not a relative of Job. This is not Job's pastor. This is Job's God. So, can I put it to you that that from Genesis, sorry, from Job 1.6, they were in service. Are you here? They were in the morning service like this because the Bible says in those days they came together, the sons of God, they gathered themselves before the Lord. So that's church. And it was testimony time. So God said, I have a testimony. Oh my God, is anybody in church? He said, have you considered my servant Job, verse 8, Job 1. He said, is a man who is, who is perfect and has choose evil. Oh my God, sorry. He says he's perfect and is upright. I love those two words. And I don't have all the time to break them down. But if God says somebody is perfect, it means you can't add anything to it. He says, number two, he eschews evil. Number three, he fears the Lord. This is God's opinion about Job. <laughs> and it is scary when I put myself in that position. What will God say concerning me? Is it because the things that you say about me may not necessarily line up with what God thinks or says about me. And you as well. I hope you understand that. When you look at man's assessment of man, trust me, oftentimes it's plastic. Are you still in church? I mean, if you don't believe me, ask the wife of Job what, he, what she thought about her husband. <laughs> Lily livered man. That's what, he call, that's what she called him. In Job 2, I think verses 8 and 9, he says, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and commit suicide. 
So they, if you ask Job and his friends what, what they thought about Job, you wouldn't buy him for 10 naira. But here God says, have you considered my servant Job? You know, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 8 and 9. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than yours. So once his relatives, his wife, everybody would speak ill about him, God said, <laughs> this man is not what you think. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There was just another man. And I have here Jacob and Esau. I'm not even know the story of Jacob and Esau. <laughs> Je Esau described Jacob as a supplanter, which means in today's legal lexicon, he was a 419 man. For Genesis 27 verse 36, Genesis 27 verse 36, my Bible tells me that when Esau went into the presence of his father to ask for blessing, the man said, you came too late, I'm afraid. So your brother has taken it all. And he said in verse 36, is he not rightly called a 419 man or supplanter? For these two times has he supplanted me. Once he took my, my birthright, now he's taking all my blessings. Father, isn't there any blessing left for me? So if you ask Esau's father, if you ask Jacob's father what they thought about, about Jacob, it was a 419. You and I will call him a 419 person. But come with me to scripture. Malachi chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. Malachi th chapter 1, the C part and the A part of verse 2. The Bible of, of verse 3. The Bible says, Esau have I hated and Jacob have I loved. Oh my God. So come with me. Come to, to the New Testament. Romans 9 13. Romans 9 13. The Bible says, as it is written, Jacob, have I loved? Have you forgotten who Jacob was? Come on, talk to me. Supplanter. So but Esau, that seemed like a soft man, a kind-hearted man, God said, have I hated? <laughs> and I wish I could get into all those details, but if you go to verse 14 of Romans 9, just because, just in case I begin to think that this God is an unrighteous God, he says, Is there any unrighteousness with God? So the fact that God hated Esau and loved Jacob, there's no unrighteousness in it, bro. And sees. Hallelujah. How many of you will have any regard for David today? If you were to live in our days. David, in one single day, committed three major sins, all of which, or each of which, should send him to the gallows. He took a man's, another man's wife, when he had access to God knows how many, slept with her. First Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter eleven, from verse number one. Looked at the husband, killed her, and then tried to make her, make him drink, so that they would say the man died from other causes than that which he died of. Do you understand what anybody would think about David in, our day, in his days and in our days? But it's important, and I'm going somewhere this morning. This is what happened. Almighty God looked at David and had this to say. In Acts of Apostle, chapter number 11, uh, sorry, chapter number 13, I believe in verse 22, Acts 13, 22, the Bible says, Concerning him, this was when God had, he had if, you read, if you read from verse 20 of Acts 13, he began by, by chronicling the history of the Israelites. He says, and I gave you a, a, a prophet ending with Samuel for 450 years. After that, in verse 21, then I gave you a, a sword to be king when you demanded a king and reigned over you for 45 years, or 40 years rather. And in verse 22, he says, and 
when he had removed Saul, he gave, he brought unto them David and made them king and said, I have found myself a man after my own heart. David, the son of Jesse, who will do not some, but all of my will. So you can say what you will. I can hold whatever opinion I thought or I, I liked about David. God says this is a man after my own heart. And I, I'm, wait a minute, I know it's a bit confusing. We're going somewhere. You can say, does God then subscribe to adultery? Does he subscribe to murder? Of course not. But you're going to find out why God formed opinions about you and I, the basis on which he forms his opinion. And you can find that from the story of David. So turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Are you still in church? Am I succeeding in confusing you? Trust the church. Just ask them question and the answer will be the same. Parrot-like. Praise God. <laughs> All right. Now let me explain to you. God will not condone either the, 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 the 419 actions of, of, of Jacob, nor the murderers and all the evil devices of, of, of David or anyone else, or Cain and all of that. But come to me. Come with me to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, you will remember, God had gotten tired of Saul the king. Do you remember the story? And the kingdom had been turned from him according to Samuel in the preceding chapter, 1 Samuel 15. So in verse Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, Samuel laid on his face and was still praying for Saul. So God said, 1 Samuel 16, 1, he says, Samuel, how long would you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him to be king over my people? Fear thy horn now and go to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his brethren. You remember the story? You remember the story? So, Samuel then went to the, to the house of Jesse. When he got to the house of Jesse, in verses 3 and 4, he said to call all his sons. How many sons did he have? Is that an exam? Read your Bible. Eight sons. And David was the last, so watch this. So, when he got there, 1 Samuel 16, 5, the Bible said, He then sanctified Jesse and his sons for the sacrifice before the Lord. And I will return to that towards the end of this message. And so, Genesis, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6, the, the sons began to appear before the prophet Samuel one after the other. So the first one, the Bible says, And it came to pass that Eliab, everybody say Eliab. Say it one more time. So Eliab came before, he passed through David. I'm oh, sorry, Samuel. He said, surely. Everybody say surely. Oh my God. When a man of God says surely, it means that I am convinced. It means that I may have heard God has nothing to pray anymore about this. <laughs> he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Mm. Again, that is the opinion of the pastor. Concerning this man. So God said in verse 7, and this is where I'm going. 1 Samuel 16, 7. God says this. God said, Mba. Everybody say Mba. Oh, say it again now. God said, He said, I have, oh my God, I love the way God put it. The first thing God said, Look not upon his countenance. Oh my God. Neither the height of his stature, because he was a very tall and handsome man. He said, for I have refused him. Now that's important. I'm coming back to that in a minute. One translation says, I have rejected him. How many of you have the translation that says, NIV, check the NIV for me. The translation that uses rejected. NIV. So many, the NAS, so many of them said rejected. And I'm not going to do grammar here, but I'm sure we understand simple, simple things that the Bible says to us. So here the man of God concluded, this man is a man of God. 
This is God's choice. God says, Michiono, shut up. I haven't told you that. But watch this. The next verse, verse 8. And then there came the next brother, Abinadab. Everybody say Abinadab. Abinadab, Abinadab. Abinadab came and God said, well, okay, okay. I've missed out the B part of verse 6. So let's go back. Verse 6 says, so do not look at his height, nor the, do not look at his countenance, nor the height of his stature. For God does not look as man looks. For man looks on the outward appearance. But I, God, he says, I look at the, I'm about to say heart matters. Say it one more time. And I'm going to end up by coming to the heart matters. So, what you're going to find out was not the singular act of David. Nor indeed the singular act or the double act of Jacob. But their heart. I'm coming to, I just I hope I have time later on for that. But here, so God said, and watch this distinction between David and his brothers. Abinadab was number, uh, sorry, Eliab was number one, was rejected. What did God say concerning Abinadab? Verse 8, 1 Samuel 16. The Bible says, I have not chosen this. I hope you know there's a difference between I have rejected this and I have not chosen this. Is, is there a difference? Good. Because if God hasn't chosen you, if number one fails, he can still choose you. But he was conclusive. As far as Eliab was concerned, this is not a candidate. Then the next verse, verse number nine. Then came Shammah. Shammah was the next brother. He says, neither have I chosen this. So there is a marked difference between number one, who God rejected, and number two to seven, in respect of whom he said, I have not chosen this. Because after verse number nine, the Bible says, then they made them to pass the seven sons of Jesse, and God didn't choose any of them. And then the next verse, he said, is there any, is this all that you got? Have you, have you any son more left? And the father suddenly woke up from his slumber and said, yes, I have one. It's good for nothing except to keep sheep. Somebody's story is about to change. I said somebody's story is about to change. And I love what God said through Samuel. He said, go and fetch him for no one will sit down until he comes. What God is going to do for those whose heart is right for him will be such that it will be a quick work. Those who are sitting on your promotion, those who have written you off, they will not be able to sit until God takes you to where he's taking you. Yeah. Come on, can I hear a louder amen? Yeah. But watch this. So they went and brought this man. Now, I wish I could demonstrate this. Don't forget that in 1 Samuel 16, 3 and 4, he had gathered all the elders of his trial. Samuel. And God said, all elders, all pastors, remain standing until this young man comes. So I can imagine legs will be shaken. Oh my God. Because they couldn't see it on the order of God concerning you. Your enemies will not be able to see it. But how fickle can the thoughts and the opinions of people around you B concerning you. And some of you have ruined your life just because of what people said concerning you when it makes no difference to God. When I was in the University of Ife, I belonged to a group that they call No Future Ambition, NFA. That's what they used to call us. But I bless God today because I have such a bright future. Oh, come on, rejoice with me, church. <laughs> because God's thought concerning me was different from what everybody else thought. But watch this. So eventually they brought the man, the young man called David. And I can imagine the man, the man was quite unsettled 
why are you disturbing me from my fellowship with my sheep? He enjoyed it. He had everything to himself. He had plenty of time. Oh my God, I wish I could break this down. Do you understand why he had so much time to write the Psalms, to write songs, to write things about God? Because he had no distractions. He was at the back of the desert with sheep and when they are asleep or they are not feeding, when they are not grazing, he sat down, wrote poems, began to learn how to pick stones out, to throw them to meet target. Oh my God. Did you think by just casting a, throw, a, a stone at Goliath, that was the first time he did it? Ah. But watch this. So eventually he arrived on the scene. And as soon as he arrived, verses 12 and 13 of 1 Samuel 16, the Bible said, when Samuel saw him, he said, Arise, this is he, anoint him. Now watch this. Did you notice that they didn't have to do any sanctification service? Great, great, great. 1 Samuel 16, 5 said, when Samuel arrived, both Jesse and the remaining seven sons had to be sanctified because they were unfit to come into God's presence as they were. But it is important that David was coming from the desert when there were no eyes except that of sheep he still kept his heart pure when we come to church when we are at work we try to be at our best as christians is that true or false but those things don't count with god what counts with God is what you do when the doors are shut. If you want to clap for God, why don't you go ahead and do so? Amen. Hallelujah. Ask anybody around David. They'll call him a daughter, a murderer. But he repented of those evils. Never went back to them. And made his heart pure and right with God for the remainder of his life. Nobody can say he hasn't made a mistake before. But that, that shouldn't be the end of life. Thoroughly renew, uh, repent before the Lord and move on with a pure and a clean heart. David says in Psalm 73 verse 1. Psalm 73 verse 1. He says, surely the Lord is good unto Israel and unto those who are of a clean or pure heart. The Second Chronicles 16, 9 that we quoted earlier, the B part, actually said God's heart, is, it says the eyes of the Lord are moving to and fro upon the earth to prove himself strong upon those whose heart has stayed on him. It's a heart matter. You want to know why God loved Jacob? I wish I can teach you about that in depth. Do you understand something? Jacob had a heart for God. He would do just anything to get what God wants for him. Well, you didn't hear that. Who was it that wrestled all night with God? Esau couldn't do that. He would rather eat for the now and go. Jacob will stay as long as it takes to the side of God. God says, let me go for the day breaks. He said, you must be a joker, God. You ain't going nowhere. Come on. Hallelujah. Let's talk about Jesus very briefly. In Jesus' days, as many people as you asked what they thought about him, you have as many divided opinions. Which was why in Matthew 16, 14, they said, you are John the Baptist, you are Jeremiah, you are Elijah. In fact, the Pharisees would say, you are a fake pastor. Isn't that what they said? Matthew 12, 24, when he was casting out devils, they said that this one cast out devil by the prince of Beelzebub. You know that what you are fake? You are not a pastor. In his hometown, Mark 6, Three to five. When he was doing some terrific things for God, they looked at him. They said, "Is this not the carpenter?" <laughs> he says, "Anointed." He said, "You are anointed to put planks together. Don't lay hands on me suddenly." Such was it that they said, "We know his brother Joseph. Joseph, Joseph all of them. They are here with us. His sisters, and they were offended at him." Mark six four. 
The Bible says in verse, verse, he could there do no mighty works, except that he healed minor, minor ailment like headache. That's what translation renders it. Because they thought little of him. He was the same Jesus who journeyed to, 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 to where was this as Lazarus was. Whatever that was. Bethlehem. Thank you, the strength of the Bible, for helping me out. Someone who in his own village cannot heal more than headache was resting the dead after four days. What does it matter what you thought about Jesus? What matters to him was, God said, Matthew 3, 16, Matthew 17, 5, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You first need to change your mental setting. Maybe when you are growing up, all your parents told you were negative words. Consign those into the, into the trash bin. You are who God said you are. But truly, between you and I, ask yourself a question. Ask yourself, am I a Christian? That's what I'm going to end. Ask yourself, am I a Christian? Why is that a hard question to ask? Ask yourself, am I a, am I a Christian? Do you understand the problem with us is that we assume that anyone who comes to church is a Christian. We also assume that the moment you answer the altar call, you're a Christian. I told you it's going to be hard this morning. But if that was it, if, if a response to an altar call, if regular church attendance would qualify you as a Christian by God's own definition, this country should be one million times better. Can, can I talk about that? Do we have Christians at all levels of government or not? I'm not talking of just this government. I'm talking of forever. <laughs> so why has the nation actually deteriorated? It's because our definition of Christianity is warped. Completely. It's not church attendance. It's not answering a call, an altar call to salvation. It's not about speaking in tongues. I don't know what I told you in this church, but I have a friend. He's a huge travel agent, a dear friend of mine, very close to me. He's a Muslim. And sometimes when he calls me, sir, like mom, he will say to me, ah, let's speak in tongues. Are you surprised that Muslims speak in tongues? It's not a big deal to them. Neither is it to the devil. Those things don't qualify you and I as Christians. So let's get back to scriptures. Turn with me to Je to. Act of Apostles, for some reason I'm talking to Genesis a lot today. 11, Act 11. Mm. This is the first time ever in the Bible that people were referred to as Christians. What does it, be, what does it really mean to be a Christian? To be Christ-like. Simple. It, it doesn't mean to come to church. Of course, you must come to church. Because Hebrews 10, verse 25, Hebrews 10, 25, the Bible says, let it not be your customs, uh, it says, forsaking not the assembling together of one another as is the custom of some of you are. So God says you shouldn't, you should not forsake the assembling together. Church, we must come. I'm saying that we need to do a lot more to qualify as Christians by God's own standard, which is what matters. So in Act 11, a group of Christians have been looking for Saul of Tarsus, as, as he then was known. So they came in verse 26, Act 11, 26. The Bible says, Then departed Barnabas for to seek Saul. Verse 27. And when they found him, watch this, they brought him unto Antioch, and he taught many, actually the Bible says much people, 
much people there and they watched them for one Sunday. Okay, that's what's in your Bible. Excuse me. Is that what's in your Bible? How long did they watch them for? And I hope you know the procedure from Act 2, 42 to 48. They gathered how often? Daily at the temple. So, I suggest to you this morning, they were gathering together when they found Saul for 365 days of the year. He was teaching, but beyond his teaching, they were watching him. So, when they watched for 365 days, there's so much you can hide for so long you can hide after 365 days they found nothing on Christ like they said these ones are Christians that's a hard test that's a serious test because all this message is talking to us about is building Christian character It's not how long you've been in church for. It's not how long, if your actions don't marry the things you do out of the church, sincerely speaking, you're not a Christian. God looks at Job. He said, this, I am so well pleased in this guy. He looked at David. He said, this is a man after my own heart. He looked at Jacob. He said, I have loved him. He looked at Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son. But he looked at other people as well. He looked at Cain. Genesis chapter number 4, from verse number 5. He said, why does your heart, why do, you, why do you become angry if there is no sin in your life? Sin has become so pervasive in the church that we, we don't even care anymore. We do it and, and we still shake our bodies and we just come to church as if nothing has happened. You can sing like a parrot. You can pray like Elijah. Maybe God does not approve of your life. What do you do when the doors are shut? As somebody says, integrity is not just marrying your words with your actions, but when you do what you do when no one is watching. When you are tempted by a woman or a man who is not your spouse, in circumstances that you didn't think anybody on earth can see or know about it, what do you do? That's what God measures you by. Not the great things you display in church. No, can somebody say an amen to that? Uh, I, I shouldn't go to that side. I hope there are no go areas. I know that, that cannot be Pastor Wally's church. <laughs> Hallelujah. He looks at Ephraim. If you remember, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim was the first born. He looked at him. Hosea 4. Verse 17, he said, let Ephraim alone, let him to the idols. Whereas I'm sure if they had asked that, is, that those brothers come before God, somebody would choose Ephraim. Because they leave him alone, let him to the idols. I've written him off. What is God saying concerning you? How are you building your Christian character? Who are the people you keep company with? And I'm not saying going out with them, that's not the issue. It depends on where you go. I just told I have a Muslim friend because I'm hoping and I'm trusting God he will preach the gospel last. He knows the Bible so much, he speaks fake tongues. And I believe God is using all of this to prepare him. Oh, you're not hearing that again. But please, there are certain things he can't ask me to do with him. There are certain places he won't go together. We're friends, but there's a limit, there's a line that is drawn. But some of you relish your old friend that you were in the world together 20, 15 years ago and you still do exactly the same thing. They said, oh, is he a Christian? There's no difference. It's only a Sunday that changes. What's your testimony? What's my testimony? You and I need to stand up and make a conscious effort to develop a Christian character. Whatever you find yourself, let the Christian character begin to build. You are not going to go there overnight. I want to encourage you. 
Perhaps you even did some things last this past one week that you hated yourself afterwards. But what are you doing to make sure that if the circumstances were to represent itself, you would not do it again? That is the issue. Character is never built in a classroom. But character is built in the circumstances of life. The classroom Bible classes or study is simply to place, is simply to place or identify character qualities and teach how character can be developed. When we understand that God uses circumstances to develop our character, we are, we are able to respond to, to God appropriately. So let me tell you this. If you are someone, for instance, who is very rash, easily angered, you have a major problem. That's just one of many things I can go on and on and on. Um, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 lists all of those fruit of the spirit that you should uh, uh, strive to acquire and live by. But if you're someone who is rash, easy to, to rough, before somebody said something, you are shouting on the top of your voices and people are passing by and said, maybe even it's in your car. I think as we were coming this morning, we saw a young man who was driving so furious, they nearly caused an accident for us. And I happened to know the young man. And I, if I remember very well, there is a sticker at the back of the car. Something about Christ. You know, everybody has a car sticker. How many of you have car stickers? Come on, don't be shy. You have car stickers that speak about your faith. Good things. But your lifestyle does not go beyond those words on the, on the car stickers. This guy was backing us so furiously that he nearly ran into us. And then was, he got to the to his gate and wanted them to open the gate. I was calling him. He had earphones on and something was blasting. I don't even know whether I was going to church or whatever I was going. I don't know. So I said to the gate man, don't open the gate. Tell him I was calling him. It was one of the reasons I was late. So they didn't, and he was screaming and shouting. So they pointed to me, please don't kill us. That is man who said we shouldn't open to you. So he came. I said, sir, where are you rushing to? You knew the time you're supposed to have gone out. If you were late, the rate you're going, if you went out this way, you will kill yourself. So I told them not to open the gate. You could see him, it was boiling. Many of us do that, oh. Maybe they splash water on you on Sunday. Oh, and Yaoshi. All manner of unprintable words swearing at people because they offended you. And I know it's wrong what they did. But when we say Christ-like, the question is, how would Jesus react if he was in your shoes? I always ask myself a question when I'm upset. How would Jesus react? If anybody saw me, not so much I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, and they saw me react in certain ways, what impression of Jesus would I have sold to such a one? Thank you for watching today's sermon. Subscribe now to get the update when a new sermon arrives.